Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, here we are. We're in our final week of the semester. Uh, and uh, you've essentially made it to the finish line. Uh, this is my last uh, mini lecture of the term. Uh, I hope you've liked them. I mean, this is a new thing for me. I wanted you to see me in the course and to uh, at least do a little bit of what I do in class to try to highlight some things or talk about some things related to what US students have been reading and exploring online. This last week of the course, you're reading about social and emotional development in middle childhood and into early adolescence. Uh, it's a remarkable period of time in terms of how we become aware of ourselves and the consequences of that awareness in our relationships to others. It's hard for me to summarize that in just a few minutes, um, but I'm always in awe of how our versions and visions of who we are uh, stabilize during middle childhood and adolescence and stay with us into adulthood in what we would call our personality, for example. So I thought I would highlight a few things from your text. Um, let me start by talking about self-concepts and self-esteem. Our self-concepts are ideas about who we are. And as with any idea about who we are, they are capable of being changed. And in the course of our lives, we grow, hopefully, as people. We change our sense of who we are, uh, the risks we take, the things that we value in ourselves and in others. But we also depend and rely upon our versions and views of ourselves. And in terms of self-concept and self-esteem, we become much more specific in our self-understanding in middle childhood and, and into adolescence. Typically, we see ourselves in several domains. For example, a uh, physical domain in which we have certain opinions and views of ourselves in terms of our athleticism or our attractiveness. We see ourselves in cognitive domains uh, in terms of specific kinds of competencies that we have. Uh, uh, one person enjoys reading, another person uh, likes math or science. Uh, and in our social and emotional domains, we see ourselves in terms of uh, friendship, uh, in terms of popularity, in terms of our relationships to siblings and to parents and others. We identify ourselves as having certain attributes and characteristics that define for us who we are. And we also look at others and begin to have more uh, psychological descriptions of what they are like and who they are. Uh, psychologists say about this that uh, our self-concepts and self-esteem become more competency-based. How good am I? What am I capable of? What can I do? That they're based more on feelings of uh, moral standards or ethical standards. What kind of person am I? What do I believe? What's my opinion? Uh, and that they involve different kinds of powers. Uh, uh, if I believe that I'm good at something, I put more energy and effort into it. It's funny because you would think that uh, in our lives we would spend more time focusing on what our perceived weaknesses were to strengthen them. But in fact, uh, if we see ourselves as athletic, we spend more time doing that. And if we see ourselves uh, good in a particular subject in school, that's what we do for pleasure and for personal interest. If you see yourself as a reader uh, and you like to read, then you put more of your time into voluntarily reading, not just because you have to. All of these kinds of things I'm talking about begin to stabilize and take more inner shape during middle childhood. So that there are many predictions about what kind of person you'll be as an adult that come into focus in 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, and 12-year-olds. Now, we don't really worry about this if the competencies are most apparent and if a person has a strong, positive sense of themselves. And you know, if uh, you like math and I like reading, fine, you do math and I'll read. It's a little worrisome for psychologists when both globally uh, children have negative self-esteem or feelings of self-worth. Uh, I can't do anything. I'm not good at anything. And it's also a little discomforting if there are particular areas 
uh, where kids feel that they can't do something. If a child feels like they're not capable of having friends, and many children feel some degree of loneliness, but if they have a more pervasive sense of nobody likes me, and that's carried forth in personality characteristics like uh, extreme shyness or over-aggressiveness that in fact make it difficult for someone to have friends or make friends, then that sense of being an outsider or of being unlovable may continue as part of that individual's self-understanding uh, well into adulthood and may have long-term consequences. Uh, what we want is not that we're all alike, but that we all feel basically positively about ourselves in a variety of areas which we can then expand and develop over the course of our lives. Well, the good news is that most kids do feel relatively popular. They self-describe in middle childhood and in adolescence that they have a group of friends, that they have some friends who are intimate and some friends who are acquaintances. And, and most kids come through middle childhood and into adolescence liking certain subjects and not liking others or feeling empowerment in some activities in their lives. Uh, and then like the rest of us, uh, as I say, uh, they pursue the things that they enjoy uh, and that they choose and that they get better at. Uh, and for the rest, they put them aside. Um, the way that Erickson describes this, and this is really where I perhaps will end today, um, is in terms of middle childhood and adolescence or in the following ways. He describes middle childhood as a period of industry versus inferiority. Now, in many classes I teach, students are quicker to tell you what inferiority means than industry. Uh, it's a term that we've heard of and maybe we've used, and of course it refers to feelings of inadequacy or incompetence. And uh, every one of us could point to areas in our lives that we feel at least somewhat that way. I'm no good at dot, dot, dot. Uh, industry, surprisingly, is a term that, though not that difficult, is one that people sometimes have trouble coming up with synonyms for. Um, the basic one I would give you is, is industriousness. That is, to be industrious means to be hardworking, but hardworking from an inner place. Not because someone is making you work hard, but because you're motivated to do so. And the trick, whether it's for parents and their children, uh, or teachers and kids, or other adults who work with kids, is to encourage them to feel a connection between their efforts, that is, what they want and what they strive for, and to connect that with their efforts to attain what they want, so that at the end of this period, uh, school-age children feel that if they want something and they work hard for it, they will attain an outcome or a product that they can be proud of. This may seem like a simple connection, but uh, it really isn't. Uh, many of us in our adult lives have areas where we don't even want something. We can't even articulate, if I could have what I wished for, what would it be? And then even when we can, some of us will have feelings like, I want something, but I can't have it, or I can't get it. Uh, it's not within my power to obtain it. Um, and surprisingly, some people who seem on the surface to obtain what would be the fruits of effort don't experience the pleasure uh, and the pride that comes from that. Uh, someone who's a workaholic might work very hard and objectively achieve a great deal and yet not psychologically feel the pleasure that comes from that. So it's not a simple thing. Uh, when children feel that if they put in their effort, they can achieve something that they'll be proud of, they feel a basic sense of competence and confidence in themselves. And this capacity to do well, uh, psychologists sometimes refer to as self-efficacy. It's not what have I done, but what am I capable of doing? It's kind of like when you go for your first real job interviews, and you might remember having that sense, uh, um, I need experience to get work, but I need work to get experience. And you have to say in an interview, I know I haven't done a lot, but I know what I'm capable of. 
that capacity uh, and one's faith in oneself and one's potential abilities is an important psychological characteristic to have. So when Erickson is describing industry, he's really describing a process by which children come to master things in their lives which matter to them and psychologically gain an inner sense of confidence in their ability to be competent. And most children do. Uh, the other aspect of that, uh, one related perhaps more to friendship, is another kind of capacity. Am I capable of being loved? Am I capable of loving others? Do I have the capacity to form relationships? And again, as I said earlier, most of us feel a sufficient amount of that capacity. But it's important as well in the school age years for children to be able to make friends. And friends not just because they're your next door neighbor or you're on the same team, but friendships that become more stable over time and that are based on feelings of mutual interest, uh, loyalty, self-disclosure. And as school age children and adolescents can really experience levels of intimacy that are very similar psychologically to what you and I might feel as adults. And that's, in a sense, what being loved is about. I can be my true self with another uh, and be accepted and tolerated uh, for who I am. And it's important for children to have positive experiences of a social and emotional nature uh, in the various parts of their world, in school, in their neighborhood, uh, in the activities that they engage with, not just with adults and parents, but with their peers. Because parents and families sort of have to love each other in some sense, uh, tolerate each other. But peer relationships are among equals, and they involve a closeness that's a mutual kind of process of disclosure and honesty and trust. Uh, children who develop a sufficient sense of industry feel that they are capable in forming relationships and capable of doing well in the things that matter for them. I just want to say a, a few words about Erickson's stage of identity versus role confusion. It marks a break from childhood, and it tells us that we are moving into the beginnings, really, of our adult selves. Identity for Erickson is a simultaneous sense of experiencing ourselves as unique, special, uh, different from any other, and at the same time, a sense of not just uniqueness, but of fitting in of feeling connected, of feeling a relationship between who I am and what's out there in the world for me. You know, an, an example of this would be as you choose vocational directions in your lives, hopefully those vocational choices reflect your inner uniqueness, your interests, your uh, capacities, uh, your value system, and that all those form part of what do I want to do? At the same time, one would hope that your occupational choices reflect what's out there in your culture, in the society. If I have interest in this and it matters to me, there are places for me to participate as an adult responsible person in the work world and make a difference. This kind of process of balance between inner resources and opportunities to connect is at the heart of having an identity, to feel both unique and to feel as if you fit in. Uh, some adolescents don't feel unique. They don't feel special. They don't feel different. Nothing sets them apart from others. Uh, some adolescents feel unique, but don't feel a place to fit in. Uh, children or young adolescents who are at risk of dropping out of school uh, may have a unique sense of themselves as being incapable of doing well in school, not liking school, being bored, and so they drop out, but they don't feel that that allows them to do anything constructive in the world around them. Erickson says you know, people choose a negative identity over no identity at all, and we might surmise from this that uh, delinquency is a possibility or antisocial behavior, because at least it's an identity. Uh, it allows you to feel uh, a place of action, uh, maybe a criminal place of action. Now, most of us develop a healthy sense of identity. And over the course of our adolescences, uh, given the proper direction and guidance, 
we do come to both explore who we are, which is the essential question of adolescence, and come up with answers that place our personal unique self in context of relationships with others and with our society that are constructive. So uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about identity statuses with you today. You can read about that in your text. But Erickson and others of that persuasion point to different pathways through which adolescents can explore who they are before committing to particular ways of life. And how a, a healthy society doesn't leave adolescents dangling. A healthy society provides opportunities through which adolescents can broaden their experience of autonomy, both behavioral autonomy, you know, what I'm able to do and to do more independently from my family, but also, very importantly, emotional autonomy, how I can psychologically become my own person. And we do this through schools, through organized activities uh, in our communities, uh, through parents uh, encouraging their teenagers to participate more in decision making and the choices that affect their lives. Uh, there's not a simple or easy way I would tell you in a practical sense to do that. But as a question to reflect upon, it's important to ask, how can I structure the world of adolescence so that I allow them to feel as if they are making choices and learning about themselves? In some ways, it's not that different from what we would do with toddlers. Uh, give them several choices, any one of which was okay with us, and let them feel in the choice that they were making the empowerment that comes from that. When there are no opportunities or when we give them no guidance, adolescents are likely to feel worse. Well, there's so much I could talk to you about in this set of readings and this week's stuff, but I think I'll leave it with you. You've had a long semester. You've held up very well. You've done your part. And I hope you've enjoyed this course. I'll see you in the future, one way or another, I hope.